Welcome everyone to the Safe to Sleep Workshop. Um, it's Tuesday, March 2nd, as you know, and we will be in here with you for the next about an hour and a half, and we're tickled to have you here with us. We have a great workshop agenda planned. Um, we'll have our welcome and introductions. We have a guest that's going to share her Massachusetts experience, Dr. Wong. Then we're going to have a few minutes to review what you are most proud of. And the teams know because they fixed their slide. So we're anxious to hear from you. And then in the last 10 minutes, we're going to talk a little bit about next steps, puddles, summer learning session. And of course, if you have any questions. Now, I want to point out who's in this workshop with us. Um, Courtney Gutman, Dr. Gutman from Knoxville is here. She is our project leader for our state project on this. So Courtney, do you want to say hello? Hey everybody, it's so good to see you all here. Uh, up to 51, yay, they found us. Great. Thanks for joining us. And then Terry Scott, our data genius, is also in this workshop with us. And we're excited. We are so excited. Now, as we move through this, remember the chat box that Brenda has pointed out. You can ask questions and Terry's going to monitor that chat box. And at the end of our session, we're going to look through and answer those questions. So be sure to chat your questions in as we go along. All right, Dr. Gutman. It is now my honor to introduce Dr. Susan Wong. Dr. Wong is an associate professor of pediatrics at the University of Colorado School of Medicine the Lula O. Labinchko Chair in Perinatal Medicine and a neonatologist in the NICU at Children's Hospital Colorado and University Hospital at the Anschutz Medical Campus. She is an NIH funded um, perinatal health services researcher whose work focuses on the transition of high risk infants from hospital to home. Dr. Wong is also, a passion, is also passionate about state perinatal quality collaboratives. During her time in Massachusetts, she formed and led the Massachusetts Hospital's Safe Infant Sleep Quality Improvement Collaborative. Presently, she leads the Colorado effort to improve the care of opiate-exposed newborns and acts as the vice chair of the Colorado Perinatal Care Quality Collaborative. Today, we are so grateful she is virtually here to share her experiences in Massachusetts with their Safe Sleep Project. Dr. Wong? Great, thank you so much for the warm introduction and I'm thrilled to be joining you, albeit virtually, but still thrilled nonetheless. Next slide. And so while I currently reside in Colorado and have resided here for about five years or so, I spent a long time training and then working in Massachusetts. And uh, it was during this time that I developed and led the safe infant sleep effort. And it's still in place in a different uh, state. Um, but I hope that what I can share with you can be helpful for the work that you're doing in Tennessee. Next slide. I have no conflicts of interest. Next slide. And so I thought I'd start off by providing um, some epidemiologic data, which I'm sure is very familiar to all of you, given the work that you do that's related to SIDS and SUIDS. But I do think that providing this background um, keeps us all in the same playing field in, in terms of focusing our work on disparities and recognizing that certain populations have much higher risk for the outcome that we're trying to present, uh, prevent. So shown here, infant mortality rates by race ethnicity from 2005 to 2014. And on average, our infant mortality rate in the US is about six deaths per 1,000 live births. But what's very apparent here is that um, infant mortality rates are in ex, um, are incredibly inequitable in the United States, where a black infant is two and a half times more likely to die in their first year of life compared to a white infant. Next slide. And so when we think about the causes of infant mortality, we know that the leading causes are congenital malformations and conditions attributed to low birth weight and prematurity. And so in 2017 and 2018, those indeed were the leading causes of death. But you have to keep in mind that those causes of death occur in the neonatal period in the first month of life. And beyond the first month of life, the leading cause of death in US infants is in fact SIDS or sudden infant death syndrome. Next slide. And so it gets quite confusing because I'm sure you've all heard the term SIDS, SUIDS, or accidental strangulation suffocation. There's a lot of overlap depending on where you live. Next slide. 
But as defined by the CDC, sudden unexpected infant death or SUID is the death of an infant less than one year of age that occurs suddenly and unexpectedly and whose cause of death is not immediately obvious prior to investigation. So it's that infant that comes to the emergency room and whose cause of death is unclear versus sudden infant death syndrome, SIDS, is technically defined as death of that infant after you've done a thorough investigation, including an autopsy, examination of the death scene, and review of the clinical history. And after all of that, if you still do not know what caused that infant's death, that's categorized as SIDS. Next slide. So the hope is that initially there's an infant that dies um, unex. Uh, you know, suddenly and you don't know, but that after a thorough investigation, you can place that infant into these categories. Is it poisoning? Is it inborn errors of metabolism, infection? Or is it SIDS because you've done an investigation and it's unclear? Is it accidental suffocation potentially from unsafe sleep practices? Or is it unknown? And you might say, well, what is SIDS versus unknown? They seem like it's the same entity. And it really depends on what county you live, what state, and what are the criteria used by your medical examiner to determine that something is SIDS versus unknown. That being said, in the US, we know that about 3,500 infants die of SUID. And most recently in 2018, from the data that we have from the CDC, about a third are defined as SIDS, about a third are unknown, and the remainder are accidental suffocation and strangulation in bed. Next slide. And so this is demonstrated here in this pie chart where it's about a third SIDS, a third unknown, and then about a quarter um, suffocation. Next slide. Now, it's, it's, a, it's a very complicated issue because we don't actually know what specifically causes SIDS. We know a lot about risk factors, but not the actual cause. We know that you've got to have a vulnerable infant during a critical developmental period, but there's got to be also outside stressors. Next. And so when we think about some of the intrinsic factors that vulnerable infants, we know that prenatal exposures like prenatal smoking, we know that disruptions in the medullary serotonin system, including the infant's genetic background and prematurity are all intrinsic risk factors. But I think what's um, really attention worthy and probably why we're all sitting in this workshop is that we care about the modifiable risk factors, the things that we can do after that baby's born to lower the suet risk. We know that breastfeeding is protective, tobacco smoke increases your risk, temperature regulation, infants that are too hot are at higher risk, and then certainly safe sleep practices are protective. Next slide. It's been confusing, I think, at the county, state, and national level because our numbers have been shifting. Shown here are trends in SUID um, by cause from 1990 to 2018. You can see in the mid-90s, we saw a significant decline in SUID as well as SIDS. That was all really attributed to the, to the Back to Sleep campaign, one of the most successful public health campaigns in maternal and infant health. And you can also see that it seems like SIDS rates may be declining most recently, but in fact, that's not really the case because in in fact, we're seeing increases in the unknown cause as well as accidental suffocation strangulation in bed. There's been this diagnostic shift that what we used to call SIDS, we're now calling either unknown or suffocation strangulation, such that the combined sewage rate has not changed in over 20 years. Next slide. Again, just like infant mortality, we know that sewage rates are also highly inequitable with um, our indigenous population being at two to three times greater risk um, for SIDS. And then our black inf infants having two to three times the risk of suffering um, SIDS or suffocation deaths. Next slide. We touched briefly earlier when we talked about risk factors on prematurity and absolutely preterm um, prematurity and preterm birth are significant risk factors for SUID. Shown here is, is data from an analysis that linked birth and death certificates stratified by gestational age weeks and looking at different types of SUID deaths. And what you could see is compared to full term infants born at 37 to 42 weeks, any preterm infant, even our who we think are relatively well late preterm infants are at significantly higher risk for suet, including SIDS and suffocation. Next slide. 
in Massachusetts during the time that I was there, we were interested in understanding this um, in a more granular detail. So shown here is data from 2012 to 2014. You can see that while preterm infants comprised only 8.9% of all births in the state, they comprised 26.7% of sewage cases. So preterm infants are overrepresented in sewage cases in the state, but also nationally. Next slide. Now, despite preterm infants be at, being at higher risk for suet, they're less likely to actually adhere to safe sleep practices, or their parents are less likely, perhaps, to follow safe sleep practices. So this was an analysis that we did using PRAMS data, the Pregnancy Risk Assessment Monitoring System, perinatal surveillance system that surveys mothers two to six months after the birth of their infant. For this particular analysis, we looked at the question of whether or not the infant was laid supine back to sleep for most of the time. And there's a few notable findings. The first is that for all gestational ages, the prevalence of supine sleep position is far from optimal. That's one. Two, that preterm infants, despite being at higher risk for suet, have low pre lower prevalence of supine sleep position compared to their term infants. And that for any gestational age group, our Black infants are less than half the times likely to be placed in the back to sleep position. And so clearly lots of room for improvement um, in our preterm, but also our term infants. Next slide. And so what are we asking families to do? And this I'm sure is, is bread and butter to all of you. There are clear guidelines put forth by the AAP SIDS task force. The most recent one was in 2016, and there will be a new one that we're putting out this year. Next slide. And when it comes to sleep practices, we're really just looking for this. We're looking for a clean crib without any items that an infant can potentially suffocate on. The infant should be placed on their back, on a firm mattress, and in a separate sleep space. Next slide. But more often, I think the babies in the NICU look something like this, right? So although on the day of discharge, we, met, we might tell families, please adhere to what the AAP recommends as safe sleep. But in the NICU for the weeks to months that our preterm infants has been hospitalized, parents may be seeing something like this. So on the left is a picture that I think is pretty similar to how a lot of preemies were um, put to sleep when I was in training, and, you know, in fellowship where twins were co-bedding. There's every sentimental item you can possibly imagine put into the crib. You're trying to reduce stimulation for babies that have chronic lung disease. And so that's what the babies get accustomed to. And then on the day of discharge, we say follow this safe, but highly um, unaccustomed kind of sleeping uh, environments and positioning. And then on the right is probably a baby that's in a children's hospital where we take care of older infants. And again, the baby looks relatively well with just an NG tube, not needing much respiratory support, but still is positioned on his side and has sort of blankets rolled up as positioning devices. So this is what families are seeing. Next slide. Moreover, for many families, they're buying things from various stores like Target and Amazon and Babies R Us, and their registries may look maybe full of items such as these. So bumpers and blankets and pillows, you know, and although we at the AAP say, you know, you should have a totally empty crib. And yet the messaging, uh, the commercial messaging is really around this. What can we sell families that make that crib look so cozy and perhaps make parents feel like they're really doing better for their infant when in fact they're we're increasing the risk for sleep associated death. And I do wanna highlight that there are some states like New York and Ohio um, that have banned the sale of crib bumpers in their state. It was actually legislated, but despite that it's still, it can be purchased on in, in many, many stores, even in those states. Next slide. In addition, unfortunately, there's advice that comes from the medical community, um, from pediatricians, that is not safe. And so this is from the website from Harvey Karp, who you may well know. You know, he is famous for the five S's and for the um, happiest baby on the block books. He's also the, the creator of the SNU bassinet that is real popular right now. And yet on the website, this is sort of a practice that he recommends for babies that still are waking up a bit too frequently that you take a, a bag of rice about a pound in weight and then you wrap it up and place it on the infant's abdomen and chest before the infant is then swaddled and placed in the snoo. So 
potentially very dangerous, you know, having a weight on the baby's chest. And yet this is what families can find on the internet from actually a pediatrician who's relatively well regarded um, in the late community. Next slide. And so clearly there's a lot of work that needs to be done because there's a lot of external messaging that our families are hearing and, and we need to gain their trust so that our safe messaging really gets through. And so this was um, really my goal when I graduated fellowship um, in Boston and I started a local improvement effort at two level three NICUs um, just outside of Boston at South Shore Hospital and St. Elizabeth's Medical Center. Next slide. And so the, the goals of this project were to increase the percentage of eligible infants engaging in safe sleep practices in the NICU, to increase the percentage of infants discharged from the NICU who engage in safe sleep at home, and then to increase NICU staff awareness about safe sleep practices and SIDS. Next slide. So here are some of the core components of our intervention. The first was nursing education. And that education occurred sort of in aggregate um, in larger forms, but also in-person presentations and bedside teaching. We had phenomenal nurses that were engaged in this effort. And so every few days they would do audits and if they um, assessed an unsafe sleep practice, right on that spot, they would provide an in-person um, education to that particular provider in that moment. So it was truly in real time. We we also utilize the online module that is available from the NICHD. It's a terrific module that we actually required all of the NICU nurses um, to take and provide a certificate of completion to us. And then we also made sure that the nurses and physicians involved in, in the NICU care designated and then documented sleep position in their notes and in their charting, such that it became part of medical rounds. You know, is this infant eligible for safe sleep? Are we actually complying with it? Next slide. And the first step was really to come up with an algorithm. We needed to assess whether or not a, a NICU infant was eligible for a safe sleep. We recognize that not all infants can do this, um, but needed some clear guidelines for the staff to follow. And so this was our version, and this was adapted from an earlier study that was done in Texas. And so for our initial effort, we said that the infant first had to be more than 1800 grams or greater than 34 weeks. And if they were not, they did what we called NICU therapeutic positioning, meaning whatever you needed to do for that infant to be medically stable. Now, the infant, if the infant met the weight and gestational age requirements, we asked, does the infant have any medical conditions that preclude safe sleep or have a lot of equipment, right? Phototherapy, central lines, are they intubated, et cetera? If they don't have that, then are there some acute respiratory symptoms for which safe sleep may not be indicated? And then for infants that had chronic lung disease that we knew would be going home on oxygen, we got them down to their basic baseline home level oxygen that they would be going home on um, and then ask the question, well, are they then in an open crib? If they are, then we initiate safe sleep practices. If they're not, say they're still in an isolate, well, let's do everything else that we can to actually model safe sleep, getting rid of the Z flows, toys, and other unnecessary objects from that isolate. Next slide. Our data collection tool was quite simple. You know, this was, um, we didn't use a fancy electronic data system. Honestly, we had pen and paper. We had these paper forms and we went around and we audited every single crib um, in our NICU. And so we did day shift and night shift in our NICU and special care nursery. We asked the question, does the infant meet eligibility criteria, yes or no? And if they didn't, then we asked what was the reason? And I should pause here and say that the AAP SIDS, redu uh, SIDS reducing task force Course, recommends that you consider medical eligibility for safe sleep for NICU infants when they're less than 32 weeks or less than 1500 grams. And we initially used those criteria, but then found that for our particular unit, less than half of the infants were eligible for safe sleep using that criteria. And that's why we ended up going to this a, a bit higher um, criteria. So once the infant is eligible for safe sleep, then we ask about the specific practices. And for our effort, we focused on four, being positioned supine, having the head of the bed be totally flat, having the crib be empty of positioning devices and empty of dolls and fluffy blankets and other potentially unsafe items. Next slide. 
And I would say one of the simplest things that worked were these um, double-sided crib cards. On one side, it was called, if the infant was designated as not ready for safe sleep, then the side that said infant therapeutic positioning was posted. And it explains to providers, but also to families that we're not quite yet doing the guidelines put forth by the AAP, but, um, uh, but they will eventually when they transition. And so, so they, they're really highlighting that we're not recommending this therapeutic positioning, but that safe sleep practices will be introduced when medically appropriate. Next. And once they are medically ready, then the card gets flipped over to safe to sleep practices. And in, for some ways, it, 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 it was a great a cue for families that when parents saw the card flipped over, they recognized also, oh, we're that much closer to going home. You know, they think that the baby is stable enough to do this sort of normal baby um, practice. And it was just reassuring to families as well that they were one step closer to, to discharge. Next slide. So shown here is our run chart showing overall compliance as well as uh, compliance with each of the four specific safe sleep practices over time. And you can see that when we first started among medically eligible NICU infants, we had only 16% of those infants that were fully engaged in safe sleep practices. And by the end of the collaborative, collaborative we were closer to 80%. What's also really interesting is that some practices were so much harder to change. So so clearly the back to sleep campaign worked because supine sleep positioning, the prevalence was relatively high to begin with. And then we got to 100%. The other things were definitely more of a struggle. And I can talk for about an hour on fluffy blankets and burp cloths, et cetera, that were so hard to get out of the crib. And, and that was probably one of our biggest struggles. Next slide. And so what was really exciting was that this effort first started in two level three NICUs and then very quickly was adopted by every level three and four NICU in Massachusetts. And then our special care nurseries, as well as our level one, our well baby nurseries came on board as well. So shown here is an overall compliance site by site where each bar represents a different birthing hospital. Next slide. Here we have our um, annotated run chart for all the participants of this statewide effort, looking at overall safe sleep compliance over time. And so by the time this paper came out, we had audited about 7,200 cribs and the data collection continues to just continues to this day, and there's almost 12,000 um, cribs that have been audited. Um, but we were really proud that we were able to significantly improve overall safe sleep compliance during NICU hospitalization from about 50% when we first started to closer to 80%. Our goal was 90%. 90, 90%. We didn't quite get there, but we um, did see significant improvements. Next slide. What was also really exciting was that we reduced significant variation in overall compliance. So shown here are um, overall compliance rates by year with the left being 2015, the middle 2016, and the right 2017. Each dot represents a different, different birthing hospital and their compliance rate. And you can see that when we first started the collaborative, no hospital was within our 95% confidence bounds. Some were doing real well and others were real low in their overall compliance rate. But but as our work progressed, and by the last year of the collaborative, nearly all of the hospitals are within our confidence bounds. And so this reduction of variability was, um, was considered a success for our state. Next slide. So what happens after discharge, right? One of the aims of our collaborative was to improve adherence to safe sleep practices in the home. And I'm sad to say that for our efforts locally and then at the state level, it was so hard to get post-discharge data. And so I'm gonna show you a few novel approaches that individual units were trying to use to really understand compliance in the home. Um, and so, at the time that I was transitioning out of um, you know, Massachusetts, there were three things that we were actively working on. One is collaborating with our Department of Public Health. Um, one was doing a surveillance system within our pediatric clinics. And then one particular hospital was doing a discharge electronic um, kind of rollout of, of, of a data acquisition. So I'm gonna highlight two of them um, during this talk. Next slide. So the first is a welcome family program. Next slide. 
So the Welcome Family Program is a home visiting program that was um, funded through McVie, through the Massachusetts Home Visiting Initiative. And so it was a specific program that targeted just very specific communities. Next slide. And so it was um, available to all mothers, regardless of income, risk, age, et cetera, but it was in certain catchment areas in Massachusetts. So certain high risk areas for adverse perinatal outcomes were identified and the service was offered in those communities. It was a postpartum visit that occurred um, up to eight weeks postpartum. It was a 90 minute visit by an experienced MCH nurse. They went through a whole slew of engagement activities, education, focused on infant care practice as well as maternal well-being and one aspect of this visit was related to safe infant sleep. Next slide. And so shown here is, is our Massachusetts map. And then in the, in the lines, just sort of up and down lines, those are the birthing hospitals. And then shown in the rectangles are the communities where this welcome family program um, developed. Next slide. And so what our Safe Sleep Collaborative did with the Welcome Family Program is understand, well, what communities um, are served by the Welcome Family Program? What birthing hospitals are in, the, in those communities? And are they participating in our Safe Sleep Collaborative? And so we certainly identified some where there was overlap in the two programs. Next slide. And so we worked with Welcome Family Program to get some amount of safe sleep data. And so these are PRAMS questions um, that were administered by the Welcome Family Program. And so they ask, in which one position do you most often lay your baby down to sleep? And then where does your new baby use, usually sleep? Next slide. And so this is an example of one of our special care nurseries. So this is Lowell General Hospital, a level two unit in Massachusetts, where the Welcome Family Program was available, but they found that the referral rates from this particular birthing hospital was really low. And so they wanted to investigate how they could also increase referrals, but also then um, collect some safe sleep data as well. Next slide. And so the special care nursery and the welcome family program came together and they developed this very specific program that was to increase the percentage of infants referred to the welcome family program at the time of discharge from the special care nursery. They wanted to increase the percentage of those infants that were engaging in safe sleep at home and then be able to share aggregate data on the post discharge infant sleep practices collected by the welcome family program back to Lowell General back to the birthing hospital. Next slide. And so these are some of the process and outcome measures that were agreed upon by the birthing hospital and then the welcome family program. Next slide. And so shown here is, is one of their kind of very snapshot run charts. And so you can see on the left is just number of infants. So these are, we're talking smallish numbers because this is a local level two um, uh, special care nursery within a short period of time. This was one particular summer. And shown in the gray line are welcome family referrals and in the purple line are discharges. And you can see when they first started, they had eight discharges, but only two referrals. And by the end, you know, all of their discharges received a referral. And I, and, and I say end, but I mean, end of this chart, but this continues um, to this day. Next slide. And then moreover, the Welcome Family Program also wanted to provide a really helpful info sheet back to Lowell General. And this is just one example of it, where in, embedded in there will be some run charts, but also some, some granular data, some actual percents um, around what they witnessed focused on safe sleep practices. Then they also stratified by special care nursery and then infants that were discharged from Lowell General from just the regular well baby nursery. And ideally, you know, the well baby nursery discharges should all be engaging in safe sleep right at birth and then post discharge. But we knew that that in fact was not happening. Next slide. So that was one particular way that one hospital got some post-discharge data. The second route that was adopted was this one by Boston Children's Hospital, and they developed what's called the DISCO tool or the discharge communication tool. And so it was developed to help transition families from hospital to home. And really their initial intent was to avoid readmissions. Next slide. 
it's a electronic tool. Um, and so what happens after discharge is that a family is texted uh, a number of questions that's discharge related. It might be around medications, appointment, um, other questions that families might have. And the families can actually directly communicate with our um, with nurses that are at Boston Children's Hospital. And so embedded in this platform were some questions around safe sleep. Next slide. And so families were asked about um, adherence to certain safe sleep practices, and then their replies were added to a dashboard. So there was a DISCO dashboard at Boston Children's Hospital that's reviewed by the NICU staff. And so, and because it's um, patient level specific, there's a lot of information that can be pulled in along, alongside their medical history and their uh, medical course in the NICU. And so the beauty of this dashboard, it was that it was reviewed in, you know, in real time by a NICU provider, a nurse. And if she noted that a family was in fact struggling with some aspect of transitioning home or not adhering to a certain safe sleep practice, they received a phone call. So there was a direct intervention that happened. And so it was beautiful because it was data collection, you knew about adherence, um, and it was also an intervention at the same time. And so this was at um, just one hospital in Massachusetts. Next slide. What we've come to realize, though, as, as we were doing this quality improvement work is that we know a lot about full term infants and sort of factors that help or hinder adherence to safe sleep practice in the home. But for the preterm population, there's not a lot of literature. And so we sort of put these interventions in place because we kind of thought it worked and there were some other QI projects that had demonstrated some um, positive outcomes, but there wasn't really good research to guide our work. Next slide. And so myself, along with Meg Parker, who's a neonatologist um, at Boston Medical Center, are in the middle of doing this study. It's called Safe Prep, Study of Attitudes and Factors Effecting Preterm Infant Care Practices. And one practice that we're focusing on is safe sleep. And the study objectives are to de determine the national prevalence of adherence to AEP-recommended infant care practices and reasons for parental adherence among preterm infants. And we're hoping that our study findings will then inform the the actual development of um, interventions to be given in the NICU and then post-discharge for this particular high-risk population. Next slide. We're hoping to recruit 1,500 maternal infant dyads um, from units throughout our throughout the US, 30 sites, 20 NICUs, and 10 special care nurseries. We've just recruited our last uh, site, and so we hope in the next year or two we'll have some data to share. Next slide. Now this work is so important and, and I started my presentation with giving you some data stratified by race ethnicity. And the reason that the work that we do in the birthing hospitals and in the NICU is so important is that we know that it's an opportunity where we can think about recognizing disparities and then potentially reducing those disparities. With respect to preterm birth, we know that black infants are one and a half times more likely to be born preterm than white infants. And preterm infants are two to three times more likely to die from suet. And so just by those numbers, we know that Black infants are overrepresented in the population of infants who are going to suffer complications from prematurity, including suet. And then even when you look at it by gestational age specific groups, preterm infants are still, preterm Black infants are still much more likely to suffer suet than white infants from that same gestational age category. So it's this ongoing um, worsening of disparities. And my hope is that what we do in the NICU actually puts a break on that. We, we probably can't do a whole lot in the short term, at least, you know, in weeks to months around the preterm birth rates that are so inequitable. But is there a thing, are there things that we can do during NICU hospitalization that can bridge the in inequitable outcomes Outcomes that we're seeing in this population. Next slide. And so many folks to acknowledge for this work, we work closely with the Massachusetts Department of um, Health, as well as several birthing hospitals throughout um, Massachusetts, in addition to the CDC, the Division of Reproductive Health. And then I'd like to highlight Munish Gupta, who is the chair of the Neonatal Quality Improvement Collaborative in Massachusetts, with, with whom I worked very closely on this effort. Next slide. 
And I wanted to show one example of an intervention that one of our birthing hospitals um, put into place. This is from Beverly Hospital in Massachusetts. It's a level two unit. At the time of discharge from their special care nursery, every baby got this onesie. Now they were not co-bedding, so that probably is, is not a great picture, but it is to highlight that, you know, on the back shows, ah, mom, you got to stop and turn me over. And so then you place the baby supine and then you see this, this side up is how you sleep. All right, I'll stop there. Thank you so much for your attention and I'm happy to take questions. All right, well, thank, thank you so much, much. Dr. Wong for sharing her project with us today. Of course, we hope that our Tennessee project meets with the same success. Um, do I think there were a couple questions in the chat. Let me see. Um, Melissa Hill question from her is for the reversible crib cards. Did you find that your staff were reliable at switching them over when the baby met criteria? It, when it was an ongoing discussion, yes. And so eventually it did become the norm, especially our auditors were ever present. <laughs> and so it depends on how engaged I think your champions are. So we had these two wonderful nurses and whenever they would be doing their audits, all the NICU nurses would be like, oh, they're coming, they're coming. And they'd make sure that everything was in place. And But in general, I think it really became routine in that particular unit, particularly at South Shore Hospital, where even our neonatologists would wonder about whether or not the crip card designation was appropriate. Um, and so it really became part of medical rounds. It was something that was discussed frequently. That's fantastic. Okay, Melissa, or um, Rachel is wondering, she loves the reversible crip cards as well. Um, are these something that we could get permission to copy from to use in our units? No, no permission even needed. I will email you everything we used. It's all available. Wonderful, thank you. And Lizzie Harvey says, this is wonderful, Dr. Wong, thank you. I'm interested in how you're collecting reasons for adherence data, is it qualitative? Do these reasons vary by race? Are you inquiring about who parents trust and look to for decision-making? And do these also vary by race? Yeah, so I think you're probably talking about the current study that we're enrolling for. And so because we're still recruiting, we haven't done the analysis, um, but it is a mixed method study. So we're doing quantitative data collection. So surveys that are done around the time of discharge, um, at four weeks post-discharge, and then about um, 12 weeks post-discharge. So there's a three, three total longitudinal surveys that mothers will complete. Um, and absolutely, we ask about who they trust, be it in healthcare, in their social network, friends, social media, a whole slew of questions. Um, and so we ask about uh, actual adherence, but also what are some of the factors that help or hinder their adherence. We also have a qualitative component and that part's actually finished and it's been published. And so my work looking at um, qualitative interviews of mothers of preterm infants related to safe sleep is available and I'm happy to share that as well. So we have lots of really interesting qualitative data as well. And I think um, some of the other points that are highlighted by this person is that all of those, the questions to those answers are actually known for the full-term population. So, and that was called the SAFE study, study of attitudes and factors affecting infant care practices. So our study, SAFE prep, is just focused on the preemies, but all the full-term stuff is out there. And I'm happy to share those publications as well. That would be wonderful, thank you. Um, to a couple more questions and then we'll wrap up. From Rachel, did you find that SAFE sleep videos are helpful? to show parents it's discharge? If so, do you recommend a certain video? So for our quality improvement effort, we didn't look at the safe sleep um, video. You know, we know that almost all the parents watch it at the time of, time of discharge, but we didn't assess whether or not that part of the intervention or that part of discharge teaching was effective in improving adherence. But where we do have data, again, it's the full-term population, um, but I would um, ask you to look at the SMART study, S-M-A-R-T. And it was a randomized um, control uh, study that was sort of a quality improvement embedded work, again, in the full-term population. The first author is Rachel Moon. 
And she looked at exactly that. There were a number of educational videos that were provided to families around birth hospitalization and then in the post-discharge period. And she demonstrated that, you know, the, the in-hospital interventions were not as effective as the post-discharge videos that the families watched. And we hypothesize that that's because the birth hospitalization for term infants is so short. There isn't much time for providers to engage with families about safe sleep, but these videos that continue for days to weeks post-discharge when watched were in fact effective in changing um, behavior in families. Interesting. Um, that's interesting because we do struggle with our limited time with families and the impact we make, but that would be great if we could maybe somehow extend our videos so they have avail availability to those after they're home and maybe less um, sleep deprived at some point. Yeah. And I think the key is that these videos were very brief. I think perhaps at the discharge video, we tend to include like everything under the sun. Um, but these that were used for the SMART study were just a few minutes long and they each video addressed a different safe sleep related topic. Awesome. Okay, and then our last question from Patty is about the DISCO project. She is um, very interested in that and wondering if you could share a bit more about it. Yeah, I mean, I could share some details, but the person who um, I will definitely connect you to is Christy Lehman, and she is a neonatologist at Boston Children's Hospital. She's the associate medical director of the NICU, and she was intimately involved in the development or actually the, the, the utilization of DISCO for the safe sleep effort. So the DISCO effort was a hospital-wide effort at Boston Ch Children's Hospital to try to reduce readmissions that they thought were potentially avoidable and related to lapses in the discharge process. So that platform really asks a number of questions around transition home. You know, are they able to get medications um, that were prescribed? Um, are they able to pay for it? Are there specific needs related to that discharge process that are unmet? Um, and then was appropriate follow-up in place and then was in fact their readmission or emergency room visit. And so the, this DISCO project was much broader than just sleep. The sleep was really brought in adding in just one or two questions that families were asked about their adherence to safe infant sleep. And if you want um, more details on sort of the development of, of that platform, um, what response rates are like, I'd be happy to connect you to Christy Lehman. Very good, thank you so much again. We just really enjoy everything that you've uh, shared with us today. Um, next, we would like to transition to our group sharing. As you know, we've asked each of you to think about what you're most proud of accomplishing so far in this project. And we're excited to hear the best ofs from each of our teams. All right, so we have 12 teams and our teams have all submitted a slide and we have plenty of time to have them share what they are most proud of. Of course, we're proud of everything that they did and everything that they're going to continue to do. So let's begin with West Tennessee Healthcare and Karen Parrish is going to represent this team. Good afternoon. Uh, I'm, I'm Karen Parrish from West Tennessee Healthcare at Jackson General in Jackson, Tennessee. And we have done some policy updating uh, of, pertaining to the AAP guidelines. We've also had mandatory in-services and skills fair, and we're in the process of doing one even right now through Thursday about safe, safe sleep. Uh, all our nursing staff and women and children's have been educated on the revised policy and the infant sleep by management and in our online learning. Um, our education, um, Patient caregiver education that we give out electronically has been revised for AAP guidelines. Uh, we have safe sleep posted in our patients' rooms. Uh, some community stuff we've done, we've had weekly social media posts by our hospital marketing. We also recorded a public service announcement and podcast with our local radio station, Woman to Woman. Uh, we have billboards out, also awareness billboards uh, with Southwest. Tennessee Child Care Resources and uh, Referral. And uh, we've also had a hospital podcast with Pete Hospitalist. So um, we're just, uh, we're, we're doing real good. It looks like you're doing really great. Good for y'all. Thank you for sharing. Thank you. All right. So let's see what St. Thomas Rutherford is up to. Alicia, 
I think you're going to share what your facility is doing. Hi there. This is Becca Falk. Ooh, Thanks okay. for having us. Great. Um, so here at Ascension St. Thomas Rutherford, we are the most proud of our safe sleep in service where we educated our women's health associates on the importance of and the do's and don'ts of safe sleep. And our associates learned by participating in a game of pointing out what not to do and then taking a selfie picture with a baby that is in safe sleep. And we're proud to report that our safe sleep audit increased by 30% after this in service. Wow. That is impressive. Good for you. Thank you guys for all your help. Thank you. Thank you for sharing. Absolutely. All right. Regina from Erlanger, are you ready to share? Hey, can you hear me okay, Patty? Yes, we can. Um, so we implemented in our NICU, we have a new um, standing order for initiating the home sleep environment um, anytime that the infant meets the criteria. And um, the neonatologist just click on Epic and it um, the nurse automatically can see when we need to start modeling that. And um, we love that crib card that they showed that has the two sides. So we're also looking um, at doing that crib card along with this uh, standing order is our soon to come thing. Um, and then um, we had staff interact with us. We did a traveling road show on both campuses and um, similar to what the last group did, we had all, all kinds of things that were not appropriate and they had to <laughs> figure out uh, how to make my baby um, live till, um, <laughs> Till the first birthday by modeling safe sleep in the hospital and then they got candy when they got it all straightened out so that was kind of a fun thing we did I, I, I like that I like that Regina thank you chocolate always works doesn't it it sure does <laughs> all right now Sumner Regional would anyone from Sumner Regional that's on the in the workshop, would you like to talk about what you're most proud of from your facility? All right, well, I, we will just go on. It looks like um, from the slide that the focus was on education and that's what y'all were most proud of. So we're proud of you and thank you for sharing that. All right, our next one is Vanderbilt. Deidre Taylor, are you willing to share with us? I am, thank you. Thank so you. with all the interventions and accomplishments that we have had this year, the following three are what we are most proud of. We were able to order and use some beautiful sleep sacks in our hospital. And after receiving those sleep sacks, um, we were able to quickly increase our usage from 20 to 60%, specifically in our mother, baby, and special care nursery. And additionally, we had close to 100 staff members participate in a powerful lecture on safe sleep-related deaths from a Tennessee medical examiner. That's right, that was a powerful lecture, I, I agree. Thank you, Deidre, great work. All right, our next team is um, from Nicewanger. Beth, are you ready to, to share? Okay, maybe she's having trouble unmuting. We'll go on and we'll come back when she's able to join us. How's that sound? All right. Lindsay Sexton, will you tell us what you're doing in Maryville, Tennessee at Blunt? Oops, Patty, we're seeing Baptist in Memphis. In Memphis. Oh, oh, oops, oops. Sorry, that's my bad. My bad. Sorry about that. There we go. There we go. There it is. Hi. Yes, I'm here. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, so um I guess we're most proud of um our goal was to increase safe sleep safe sleep practices at our facility. 
um, increase it by 50% from where we started. Our early data showed us that we were about 75% compliant. And over the last couple of months, we improved that to 95% com um, 95 compliance. And um, our biggest hurdle seemed to be the extra items in the crib. So we had our nurse hats on already. And so we decided to put our mom hats on and uh, see how we could help our moms and our families and the nurses as well, keep those items out of the crib. So we came up with our little uh, safe sleep caddy that we added to our bassinets, just a simple purchase, but we found that it's made a big difference. Our nurses love them and makes uh, everything easily accessible to our, um, our moms and especially those moms that have had to have a C-section so they're not having to bend over so much. And um, that is our highlight from this year. And that's a big highlight because many of the other facilities are interested in trying this as well based on y'all's experience. Yes, we're excited about it and we were so excited to be a part of the project this year. Thank you, Lindsay. We appreciate it. Thank you. Let's go back to Camille. I don't want to miss Camille with Baptist Memorial. Okay. Let's see. All right, I'll go forward again and we'll come back. All right, our next one, um, Dawn, is going to talk about East Tennessee Children's and what they're most proud of. Okay. Hi, Patty, are you there? I am. Hi, good afternoon. <laughs> Hey. Um, so I think with us, it's been such a, it's, it's been such a tremendous year for us and looking at some of the things that we've done, um, as far as our policies, including all the hospital, but I think this was a, a big one for us, um, as far as education wise with our parents, um, looking at only the brochures that the state of Tennessee offers with the Department of Health, but also with the crib cards. But this was a great incentive for us to be able to introduce education to our families, outside of the unit so it had the capability they have that capability to actually go on um, and review this discharge criteria um, while at home or if they're still in postpartum or recovering so i think it was a tremendous effort on our part um, and something i think that we're, we're super proud of so that's awesome thank you for sharing that thank you all right, Jamie, can you talk about Centennial Women's and Children's successes? What we are most proud of for our unit is we've worked really hard um, to get our numbers up. We did a safe sleep road show um, with the same thing a lot of us talked about in our previous meetings and calls. Um, the staff really enjoyed it. They were really engaged, got some uh, some of our winners got gift cards, which is always a good incentive. Mm -hmm. After that road show, we were able to increase our numbers, um, specifically in the newborn nursery. Um, our last two, I believe it's our last two months, we've had 100% safety sleep compliance in our parent rooms. So our uh, newborn nursery is doing a fantastic job making sure our parents are educated. Um, we've also just implemented, they've just made their way into the units and onto the cribs, our new crib cards for our babies that have, that have medical needs for different positioning aids, whether it be a Z-flow for head shape, a baby that's you know a chronic lung disease baby that needs some different support, these will be in their cards, their cribs. Um, it starts that discussion with our family so we can explain that this is while they're here in the hospital. And at the bottom of the card, it mentions that they'll transition to safe sleep before going home. It's also a good eye catcher for families who might walk into the unit and see a baby especially in our larger cribs, that maybe it's a baby that needs to sleep prone for a medical reason, they would see this card and see it's something a little bit different in the card. It allows us to educate all of our families at all times for about safe sleep. So we're really proud of those initiatives that we've placed so far. So um, as a little side note, I, um, my, one of my oldest friends had her first grandbaby last week at, at Centennial. And I went down to, to see the baby and 
I happened to walk in when the nurse was doing the discharge teaching and the nurse didn't know who I was. So I got to listen to her safe sleep education and I have to say it was stellar. That is awesome, Patty. I love to hear that. And I'd love for you to share her name with me so I can recognize her as well. All right, I can do that. I can do that Thank in that. private, in private. <laughs> yes, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you. All right, my friend Suzanne from Summit Medical Center. All right. Good All right. afternoon, everyone. Oh, there you are. Great. Thank you, Suzanne. You're welcome. So our summit team is most proud of, of getting our hospital safe sleep policy updated um, first and foremost to reflect the current AAP guidelines. And in addition to that, we've really spent a lot of time on education um, and reworking that piece of it. Um, we have worked on our nursing education resources as well as our, our parent and caregiver education resources. We've done a lot of that by um, incorporating safe sleep education into our nursing skills days and just discussions at um, safety huddles, blast emails, and then we're really working right now to edit a lot of our written materials because we just found that there, there was a lot of redundancy in those. And so we really are setting out to create just a simple, clear, consistent message um, about safe sleep practices. So that's our goal right now. We look, we're just really looking forward to um, continuing to work on this project. We feel like we're kind of just getting started. So we're looking forward to what's to come. I like hearing that you just feel, you feel like you're just now getting started because I happen to know y'all have done a lot of good work. So that's exciting. All right, Dr. Gutman, what about UT? Well, I guess I went for the basics here on this. Sorry, everybody's are so beautifully done. I'm so impressed with everybody. Uh, we'll kick it up a notch next time. But we have been working really hard, and, and I know that y'all know that. Uh, we are most proud in the newborn nursery, mother baby, for our teamwork to improve compliance. This includes rounding with parents three times daily to assess and provide immediate feedback to the sleeping situation. Um, and then in the NICU, having a clear approved policy, including limiting head of bed elevation, eliminating reflux as a contraindication to safe sleep and refining our NAS sleep environment. And then um, our rollout of our crib card, which now that we have it rolled out, I'm really liking this double-sided one too, so. <laughs> Phase two, phase two of the crib call. Right. <laughs> All right, good work. Thank you. All right, I'm going to go back and see if we're able to hear from um, the ladies that are our gentlemen that um, we couldn't hear from. So Baptist Memorial, Camille, can we hear from you now? Are you with us or can you unmute? All right, well, I'm not, um, I'm not from this hospital, but I'm not gonna let this hospital not be represented in this special time. So I can read this poster. <laughs> Safe sleep is modeled in the hospital with sleep sacks. They have gotten a embroidered logo gift bags and sleep sacks that they're giving to all families. Well, I know we're all jealous about that. Um, they've created a no blanket zone in their mother baby unit. And you can see that they've done a lot of education with their nurses, with their staff and safety audits. So good work to Baptist Memorial. And then um, Beth, have you been able to join us from Nicewanger? Okay, well, I'm gonna represent Nicewanger as well. Um, I love how she was so honest here, surprised at their inconsistencies when they were doing their crib audit audits. So they use that and turned it into something positive by focusing on education. They've identified barriers, lack of a consistent approach, and then noticed that they needed education across differing levels of experience. A soft rollout in November of 2020 with bulletin boards, email blasts, and team talks. They did a big literature review on that dreaded topic of elevation of the head of bed. 
and a big practice change surrounding that. And upcoming, they're wanting to standardize their education. And then they're also interested in crib cards. So good, good work to all the teams. Thank you for sharing. We are so proud of you guys. You've done great work. And one thing I wanna also say is I'm always so impressed by the level of sharing. Um, I, I love the way the teams are willing to share anything, their policies, their crib cards, uh, how they're getting something paid for, their crib caddies with the other teams. I think, I think that's amazing. Don't you, Dr. Gutman? Absolutely, Patty. That's a great point. It's really truly been a state um, collaborative, a state project. I'm proud of what we've done together. Room two, room two. All right, so next steps. We do have some upcoming huddles, April 6th. 2 p.m. May 4th at 2 p.m. And then we're hoping to plan a summer learning session, date to be determined, and whether it's in person or virtual will obviously be um, up, up for discussion based on what's going on in our world. But please mark your calendars for the huddles if you haven't already, because we would love for you to participate and learn more. And then of course the learning session. Um, do you did you know that TipQC is now doing podcasts? If you don't, if you didn't know, you're going to know by the end of these three days. There are some great topics, and there are three of them specific to safe sleep. How can you access them? You can go to the TipQC website, and up across the top, in that um, ribbon of activities where they have meetings and projects, there's also one that says podcasts. So you can access every single one of them right there from the TipQC website. Or I am personally learning to access podcasts and you can do a search on whatever podcast app you're using for TipQC and it'll come up right away and you can mark it as a favorite, which I, even I can do that with, that's amazing. They're trying to do a new topic every week, alternating between maternal and infant and also from speakers across the state. So these are what we have so far, but there are many more to come. So before we break, Terry, would you like to talk about any of the questions that came in through the chat? Do we have any questions that we haven't addressed yet? So hopefully, can you guys hear me? Yes, ma'am. Okay, wonderful. Um, so there were no additional questions after the questions that um, Courtney went through. So thank you, Courtney, for going through those. Does anyone have any additional questions? And I do want to mention that before we close off today, if the Breastfeeding Coalition um, is having an optional session starting at 4.30. And if you are interested in joining that one, you would close out of this Zoom meeting, go back to your Leader Pass page, and then there is a tile for you to join that workshop as a separate Zoom if you're interested. Um, but that's, unless anybody has any additional questions right now, those are all the questions that we had received on, on Dr. Huang or any, anything else. Okay. Well, may I take this opportunity to recognize Dr. Gutman and for her leadership in this state project. Her passion for this project is quite obvious to anyone that is um, around her on the huddles. And I just want to recognize you for your hard work in this. You've done an amazing job. I also want to shout out to Dr. Murad from Vanderbilt. She's also been very instrumental as our infant medical director. And of course, the teams. We have had amazing teams with amazing energy. So um, shout out to everyone. Everyone is doing such good work. Please keep it up. And we look forward to seeing you tomorrow and in April for the Safe Sleep Huddle. Any closing words, Dr. Gutman? No, thank you so much, Patty, to you as well. I'm a lucky girl to get to work on a project that I'm extremely passionate about with um, such great people who care just as much as I do. So thank you all very, very much. It was great to see you all today virtually and looking forward to tomorrow. All right. Thanks, everybody. You're getting out a little early, so we're going we're gonna to hold on to that if we're running late tomorrow, okay?